hardly anybody around on the lower to shoots back in those years. Yep. In the you know late forties and fifties. In fact, my dad used to say, <clears throat> you know, uh, it's really nice to to be able to, to uh, have all this water all to ourselves. And then what happened was one of the uh, somebody wrote an article about it and put it into the Dallas newspaper about the fish, the steelhead in the Deschutes River. Yeah. And that brought a whole bunch of people in. And my dad, who back then you could, you would only see maybe one or two, say maybe five or six fishermen at most. That was my dad, Doug Stewart, talking about the early days of fly fishing on the Deschutes. Today, we hear from one of my biggest mentors in fly fishing. This is episode number 31 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Uh, before I get started here, I just want to remind you again, if you get a chance, leave a comment in the blog post at wetflyswing.com slash 31 with uh, maybe a little comment on who one of your biggest mentors was in your fly fishing uh, life. In today's episode, I interview Doug Stewart, one of the pioneers of steelhead fly fishing in Oregon and on the Deschutes. We talk about the early days of fly fishing in Oregon, the Max Canyon fly pattern, and fishing for salmon in Alaska. You'll get a little background and perspective from a fishing guide of over 30 years and understanding a little more about what what makes me tick as well as uh, my dad. Don't miss out as I get a chance to ask my three biggest questions that I've been holding out on. Hint, one has to do with spay casting. So, without further ado, here's Doug Stewart from flyfishingwithdougstewart.com. How's it going? Pretty good. Good. Pretty good. Good. We uh, we did an interview about uh, I think God, I think like two or three years ago. You remember that? Yeah. And yeah. in the same place, and I was going to post that on you know on uh, iTunes, but I think this will be a better, hopefully, better audio and maybe different content. But we'll have to yeah. listen to that one. I'll I'll have a link to that episode, yeah. or that show we did. But uh, I always start out. Um, you know, I guess first, I think there's probably some people will know Shannon, other people that are watching, but a lot of people won't know that uh, our connection. So, what is the uh, what is the unique connection we have? Just so everybody that doesn't know, you mean father son? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so this this is my dad, and uh, I talk a lot on the show on the podcast about mentors. I ask a lot of people that question. You know, who are your mentors? And it's always interesting because. I hear different things from people, and one person that comes up a lot is Roderick Haig Brown mm-hmm. for a lot of people. And um, before we get into your uh, history, I would be right off the bat just to, you know, when you hear the name, when you hear that name, what what comes to your mind? Roderick Haig Brown. Yeah. Uh, well, I got to think on that. Uh, some of my m- mentors you're talking well, about. Well, I'm just thinking, like for you, I, I think Roderick uh, that name comes up in a lot of people as a mentor, but, um, does that name mean anything to you or what, do, what does it mean? Well, you know, I've, I've read his, his, his works and, yeah. and I never met him personally, but that's about as far as it goes for, yeah. you know? Yep. Yeah. So he was, uh, somebody that you, when you were first getting started was somebody you, yeah. And I, yeah. I was, it was an influential and it's something that it's a good way to get started, getting to learn, Yeah. you know, the people you meet and yeah. learn their side of the, the deck, you know. It's interesting because I was just, the previous episode, which, uh, let's see, this is episode 31, and episode 39, or um, 30 was April Vokey, and she mentioned that Roderick was one of her big influences. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's funny because I went online a lot of times, I'll find, try to find pictures mm-hmm. of people or links to old, and when I came up, one of the uh, Google images was a picture of Roderick Haig Brown, I'm not sure how, how old he was, but probably pretty similar to your age now, and he had the exact, very similar hat. It almost huh? looked like you out in the water. <laughs> so you're going to have to like take a look at that photo and see because it, like when I first saw it, I was like, geez, that, that looks exactly like the same hat and everything. Mm-hmm. But, <clears throat> so maybe you can just tell us, uh, you know, how you got into to fly fishing. And, you know, I know a big thing was steelhead for season one, which we're getting out of um, now. But you were influential in the beginning of steelhead here in kind of the northwest. How did you get into fly fishing and steelhead? 
Well, my dad was a, a steelhead fly fisherman, you know, and originally he was a big, you know, a, not a big guy, but he, he used hardware. But eventually he, he was a, uh, you know, for trout and all, he used uh, flies. And eventually when I started, he, he influenced me with, uh, he, he showed me a lot about uh, casting and, you know, um, making the right moves and following uh, his, his lead. I just learned from him a lot. And it's basically it goes back to when probably I was about uh, 11, 12 years old when he first took, started taking me on the Deschutes River. And that's where I learned how to cast. And eventually I started learning how to fly fish. So that all happened, you know, way back when in the early fifties, mm -hmm. basically is when I started. Yeah. So yeah. you're, so 12 is when you first picked up a fly rod. Yeah. 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 I wasn't really good at to begin, begin with, but, uh, eventually, uh, as he got older, he, he, he couldn't catch the fly as well anymore because, yeah. you know, and, and, he, he couldn't wait as well, and that kind of is what's happening to me now because I'm at, at maybe the age of what he was at the same time, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it was a nice transition from those early years. From gear. And the thing about it, there was hardly anybody around on the lower Deschutes back in those years. Yep. In the, you know, late 40s and 50s. In fact, my dad used to say, <clears throat> you know, uh, it's really nice to, to be able to, to uh, have all this water all to ourselves. And then what happened was one of the, uh, somebody wrote an article about it and put it into the Dallas newspaper about the fish, the steelhead in the Deschutes River. Yeah. And that brought a whole bunch of people in. And my dad, who back then you could, you would only see maybe one or two, say maybe five or six fishermen at most. Yeah. Well, after that piece, in the news came out there was like a dozen people out there and my dad really got ticked off you know he said he said this this river is getting too darn crowded you know there were 12 people yeah, yeah. <laughs> right so then so that was back in the 40s and 50s and when did the uh like steelhead when did that for flies when did that start that started when we started fishing down at max canyon and back then, <clears throat> most of the time, we were fly fishing, and all the fellows that I fished with. And uh, there was just, uh, everybody was pretty much fishing bait back then and lures. Mm -hmm. And there was hardly, I don't, I can't remember anybody else using flies. And Steve Dorn and I and uh, uh, a couple of our other friends, we started fishing down there. And there were a few, uh, you know, spin guys, but not with guides. But we basically had a whole river to ourselves, and when we started catching fish, it was really a, an a exciting event at that time. So that was in, so what year was that when you? About 1960, 61. So 61, and there was not, there weren't too many people flying. Not this down at the Max started. Cannon area. No, no. Uh -huh. Very sorry, very few sleds, hmm. hardly any sleds at all. Yep. I mean, there was some, you know, but not like it is today, that's for sure. Right. Yeah. And then I had, uh, yeah, I had Jim Teeny on in episode five, and we were talking about, I think he got into it. Let's see. When did, uh, I guess it was more into the, well, you started fishing with him in the 60s too, or was it? Yeah, so, that's, yeah. Back, that's where I met him. Met him and his dad down there at Wagon Blast. Oh, on the Deschutes. On the Deschutes. Okay. We had hiked up, you know, yep. from the mouth, my dad and I, and uh, let's see, we were, we got there at Wagon Blast first, and we started fishing and hooked a few fish, you know, right away, because back then there was a lot of fish in that area, but uh, all of a sudden we see Jim and his dad come walking down. And they came walking in and said, hi, how you doing? And introduced himself, you know. Yep. And then he asked if uh, they could fish there. So we said, yeah, anyway, that's that's how we got to meet uh, okay. them. And then and then you guys got into the, and that was before Jim got into his company. And yeah, he was, lines. but he was just starting it, you yeah. know, with his flies is what he was doing. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you, from there, you got into eventually into guiding, and you guided. Well, I've I've interviewed a bunch of guides that have 
you know, some guided for a short time, some a long time. You guided for quite a while. What was the, um, what do you think was the best thing about guiding or being a guide? Well, the best thing was when you got people in to do a lot of fish. <laughs> yeah. you know? And, there, you know, there were certain times when, back when the steelhead fishing was really strong, you know, in the early 80s and, and so forth, uh, well, the mid-70s and early 80s, it was really easy to take people down there and get them into steelhead, you know. Mm -hmm. But then there was that one seven-year stretch where the steelhead disappeared for a while. And yeah. that became a real problem. So a lot of the guys quit guiding. Uh, and, but I kept guiding because, and I and a guy had started guiding for trout instead of steelhead back then. And uh, eventually the fish started coming back. And I think my tenure... Uh, over all those years was maybe probably 30 plus years in mm -hmm. guiding, you know, mm -hmm. and main reason I got out of it because it was just getting to be, uh, it was getting, I was getting older and it was just too much trouble anymore. And the fishing wasn't as great as it used to be too. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a, uh, a story from those 30 years, maybe a, 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 a memorable or a crazy fishing story, something that rings a bell? Uh, well, yeah, I got a few of mine. <laughs> one, one was, uh, fishing at right across on, or you, when you, when you guys were young, you know, we took, we took you guys yeah. up there at Marsh's Drift or the pipe hole, they used to call it. And, uh, I used to, uh, raft across and walk up and get into this one hole where I call the rock garden. And it was something that was, you had to weed, or, you know, wait up to about your waist and then get out to reach the water. And you, but you had to wait on it. was really rocky. And, uh, but the fish were out there back then and bam, bam, you could cook a fish. Well, this one, uh, was a pretty good sized fish and I hooked it and I started going out and, and I slipped and all of a sudden I'm floating down river with this fish. <laughs> And I'm playing this fish, but luckily I had, you know, a belt around, tightly around my waist. And I floated around maybe about 20 yards around the other side of that hole, and I was able to get out and eventually land the fish. Mm. So that's a, one of the craziest things yeah. that ever happened. Was that? And I never waited as deep as anymore yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> nice. What's uh, so the, in the fly shop you had for a number of years? I think you started in the. I think the seventies. Well, maybe just talk about how that you, how that all got started. You mean with uh, Stewart's Fly Shop? Well, originally it wasn't Stewart's Fly Shop. It was oh, like, right. we had another name. That's before I and uh, I forget what Stewart's Custom Tackle. That's what it yeah. was. The first name, right? But then when we we got into the more of the fl fly fishing and fly tying and all that stuff. Yeah. Then we we made the name Stewart's Fly Shop. Okay. Yeah. And then, and you had that going for quite a while. Just, uh, it, things have changed a little bit. I think that obviously there's still fly shops out there, but I was talking to a guy at fly fish food who has a big uh, online retail, real retail store. Uh -huh. And it's all, I always ask the question about, are you hear a lot of people say, you know, don't get into the fly fishing niche because of the money uh -huh. because it's hard to make money Yeah. in, uh, in fly fishing. What did you find over the years? What was the, the biggest challenge with running a fly fishing business? Uh, biggest, well, biggest challenge initially was building up, having, building customers, you yeah. know. How'd you, what was the, how'd you build customers? Just uh, word of mouth. Guys would come in and, you know, hey, this is, find out there's a new fly shop, you know, out here. And eventually, you know, I think we had a really nice shop. It was kind of low-key, not not high-pressure stuff. Mm -hmm. And we just, uh, we had, uh, and I had a few helpers along the way, you know, when we ran, you know, uh, certain programs and uh, seminars every now and then. And I taught fly tying lessons, you know, and fly mm -hmm. casting and all that. And eventually, over a period of time, just started building up where we got more and more customers. And what really did it for us was when they come out with that, that one movie about uh, river runs through river it. runs through it, and that was one of the greatest things that happened because for three years, 
<laughs> my sales just started rising right. and rising. Right. People were coming in for fly tying lessons, for fly casting lessons, for all any kind of yeah. a lesson with dealing with fly yeah. with fly fishing. You know? And and then it slowly kind of slowly petered off, right? Yeah, it, it tapered off, yeah. but it still held its level even after yeah. that. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And the only thing that hurt us was in the. Uh, Let's see. Two thousand eight. Six. This, huh? Or uh, I was thinking of the, the two, first recession there. Oh yeah, right. The whatever that was. That was in eighties uh, uh, or something. Yeah, yeah. the early eighties. Yeah. It's first or second, second in the eighties, and that for four years was a real struggle for everybody, you know. But eventually, you know, we moved. That's when we moved up into Wood Village, mm -hmm. and we built the business up again. So. Yeah. You have to be aggressive and stay with it and yeah. believe in and believe in yourself and what you know and keeping your clientele mm -hmm. you know well, do you have a uh, a tip for uh, somebody new, maybe a new guide or somebody getting into it? A new guide? yeah, like somebody that's wanting to get started or maybe a guy that wants to start a a new shop or just interested in being you in should go in and talk to a, a a decent fly fishing shop, yeah and get some information from them. that's what guys. Came into me. Yeah, I bet you I probably got uh, a dozen over the years yep. of other people, you know, and in, into that business. So they just let you know who they were and they're interested. In yeah, I came in and talk and ask questions, and again, that builds more and more clientele. And yeah, so all right. And do you have uh, do you have you have a few books that you've written over the years, right? Yeah, maybe you can talk about your books that you've written well the first one was tying and fishing outstanding flies i don't know if i got one around I, i'll put a link in the oh all right yeah yeah and it was just a, a beginning of fly tying book and it did have go along with the stories that i always like to put in my my uh, writings you know mm -hmm. the second one was uh the practical fly fisher and that was the the latest one uh which was pretty pretty uh long yeah. piece you know yeah but that that carried a lot more information and uh it's really challenging to write but it, it turned out pretty good and i got one i went now what i'm doing i i changed my pace a little bit and i started to get into bass fishing a little more mm. and so i wrote a i've written a book now on, on bass fishing that i hope to get published here in the next uh mm -hmm. you know this, this coming year uh, and you're also doing some articles and some of the fly tying and yeah. fishing magazines right on yeah, yeah. articles right. Mm -hmm. i'll uh i'll hit, i'll provide links to the book uh the books but what um magazines have you written over recently well the uh, uh fly tying journal right or, yeah it's all yeah basically fly tying if and fly fishing all you know yeah it's a lot of different things going along with that Okay, I'll uh, I'll try to get links uh, at least links to uh, those those in the show notes. Um, what do you think? You know, I when you published your first book, you said it was a ton of work. What, what did that you know? What did that feel like when you first had your first book published? What was that whole experience like? Actually, it was my second book. With my first, oh, that's right. The first book I wrote was on rattlesnakes. Rattlesnake tales. Yeah, rattlesnake tales. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if I can find that one. Is that one on the Amazon? Yeah, that's. So, well, I think it's. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's there the one right there. there. So yeah, <laughs> for those that can't see it on the audio, it's an yeah. orange, bright orange book, yeah. uh, rattlesnake tail. So yeah. I'll see if I can get. I'm sure these are out there somewhere, right? You can oh, it could be. I don't know. I sold quite a few of yeah. them over the years, but so what? So I guess that was your first book that was published. What was your your first fly fishing book? What did that feel like? That was the well. That was the the one I just the first one I yeah. just mentioned. Was it a pretty smooth process or? Well, it was, it was, uh, you spent a lot of time yeah. writing and were you relieved when you got done or were you ready to be like, okay, what's my next book? No, I, well, one, one advantage I had was my wife and she was, she's very, uh, adept at, you know, looking up my work and critiquing it. Yeah. And so that helped a lot, you know? Yep. Yeah. I was, uh, just remind me, uh, can't remember who I was talking to. Uh, you know, John Gearock yeah. has written a lot of books, and he was always oh, uh, Steve Duda, who I was, who is the editor of the Flyfish Journal. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. magazine and I was talking to Steve and he was talking about some of the people that send stuff into him. Mm-hmm. He's the editor. And he said that when John gets, he submits stuff regularly and he says he doesn't ever have to touch it because it's perfect mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. every time when, when John, right. you know, right. which is saying a lot, I guess, because a lot, a lot of times editors have to do a lot of work. Right. Right. Um, but that is a process that, yeah. 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 It was definitely a part of it. Um, so I was kind of thinking, I'll have a link to uh, your site, your website, things like that. But um, as far as steelhead, and I asked this to Jim, we were talking, you know, the Sandy River and Cubits in, in that area and mm-hmm. the, the slaughter hole. Yeah. What was that that time like when you guys were fishing that down there for well, steelhead? Well, it was it was absolutely awesome, and the reason being back then that river was carrying over ten thousand steelhead per year. Right. And you, you could just, I mean, you could stand up on the bluff and then walk down and get a vantage point, and all you could see were steelhead in like two to three layers. And it was just, there was tons of fish in there. And so it was a no brainer to go out there and, I mean, you know, use flies were the best thing because what happened was a lot of the, the spin fishermen, you know, the bait fishermen, over a period of time, steelhead would get wise to what's going on. And we could see fish in these different layers. Watch the guys pitch their rigs out there, you know, sand shrimp or whatever they're using. And they co- they'd plop down and the fish would just move apart, let the food go down the middle, and then they would come back. Yep. And that was, that was I say, after, you know, they had been really hammered but with flies you're talking about one little small number six or four size fly with a a 12 foot leader and all you had to do is pitch it out into you know the group and just start slowly stripping it and it was wham they'd be take they'd take and that's why uh one day i remember jim and i just to see how many fish we could hook we uh Hooked and I, re- I released, if I can remember, I think it was 58 steelhead. Jeez, in one day? In one day. Well, it was in like a four-hour day. And would you catch them all on the... on the, uh, We use a lot of Jim's nymphs. Team nymph? Yeah, yeah, I use some caddis. I mean, I use my little dark tie-down caddis. So you weren't using little uh, glow bugs or anything like no, that? No. Uh-uh. You were, you Although were, they work, but you we... You were swinging... Yeah, it was on the swing. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Using Jim's or some sort of the deep water express scientific angler. Yeah, well, he had his own flies. Yeah. I mean, his own yeah. lines he, out there. He talked about, I think when you guys were fishing, it was before they had some of his lines out. You were using the scientific yeah. angler. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So what, uh, have you ever uh, thrown rocks at fish to get them in position like Jim, like Jim has? No, no. I, I, you know, frankly, I never saw him do that yeah. personally. I asked him that question <laughs> because I, I can't remember what I heard. I I didn't know the story that was, I heard from him. That was on... A river in Washington, he was doing it, yeah, I believe. Yeah. yeah. And he, so yeah. Uh, his story was you can go back to episode five and listen to Jim tell it, but basically, a big magazine in New York wrote the story about him, and the title was The Man Who Throws Rocks at Fish. Yeah. I mean, and uh, I so that was that. the article yeah. that came out. But what, what Jim said was basically, you know, he doesn't throw rocks at fish, he throws rocks behind fish or around fish to get them to move right, right. away. Yeah. And the point he made was it's not too much different than if you wade across the river towards the fish. To yeah. Gonna, yeah. You know, so I, I kind of see that point, but uh, <laughs> I just had to ask that. I thought well, that was funny. Um, so, uh, spay casting, spay fishing, all that uh, stuff is a big, especially for winter. Well, I guess people use it all around. Mm-hmm. What, uh, what kept you out of uh, getting in fully into spay casting and teaching spay casting and like well uh, I just you know it was it was a new thing and I started out there were guys coming in wanting them to have some rods built because you know I, I built a lot of many many rods over all the years in that shop and uh, I just got to a point where uh, I built a couple of rods but it was just it took too long too much time I mean it's a real process you know. And the other thing is that I just never could get used to, I mean, I learned how to do it, you know, and using the right methods, but I just felt more comfortable with, you know, casting with my right or left hand because I could cast both ways. So I didn't need to do, you know, any fancy stuff. 
and I could still reach, you know, 65, 75 feet out there with, with my casting ability. Right. So that's one reason I never got into them personally, plus the fact uh, there were other outfits that were monopolizing, you know, their products, and I just never got into it. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I may, may probably didn't make the money I should have, but yeah. then uh, yeah. everybody's got their own way. Right. You know? <laughs> well, the one nice thing sometimes with the space, especially for winter steelhead, is being able to cast really heavy lines and really big lines. Right. That yeah. is one help, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I guess on the on the Deschutes. So, yeah, I mean, I have heard lots. I think was it Haig Brown? There were some older guys that you know kind of did both, but there were times when they just used single hand rods because mm-hmm. they didn't feel they needed to cast. Yeah, well, that's you know? that's true. And to this day, I mean, I can still get out there and cast yeah. sixty five, seventy right. feet. But I, but I don't wade too steep anymore no. either. And, and a lot of times, there, the fish are within thirty feet anyway. Yeah, that's, that's right. So. Doesn't matter. I always cover the short water first. Yep. Yeah, that's yeah. a good that's a good tip. Uh what uh as far as tips, other tips, what would be your for steelhead, your, you know, best steelhead tip that you'd give somebody? Uh you mean to learn or to or just In, anything, somebody that maybe is just getting started in steelhead or maybe they've been doing it a while but they've been struggling. Well get with get a not the most expensive outfit, but get a good a good outfit at a reasonable price. And make sure that uh, to have somebody help you get started, you know. Uh, don't rely on just going out there and trying to learn yourself. And uh, I would always take guys out, regardless if, you know, if, if they bought a rod for me or not. I go out there and give them casting lessons if they wanted help, you know. Yeah. But basically getting into it, just uh, make your mind up that I'm going to learn this and be positive and you can have great results stick with it yeah yeah what's the the max canyon was a fly pattern that was pretty popular and that was another um person we had on the show uh john shuey in episode uh, i think 16 mm-hmm. right. he made he made the point you know we were t- actually i met him at, at an event this year and we were talking about the max canyon and how he talked about how influential that whole thing was you and the Max Canyon and, and to, to him mm-hmm. and a lot of people. So it was, I never had never really heard that, you know, from that perspective. Mm-hmm. What's uh, maybe you tell the story of the Max Canyon, how that all came to, came to be. Well, yeah, that the story is, has pretty well been, been told over a lot of years. Uh, but basically it was just that Max Canyon, you know, and we came in off, uh, it was a real hot, uh, day like in the high 90s and low even hundreds so we used to come in fish right early in the morning and then come back and get underneath the trees and sit down there and where there's close to the water and every once in a while we start we tie flies you know to kill time and so one day steve dorn and i were sitting there just making stuff up and i uh i don't know i just like the color of orange and black, you know. Mm. So it all started from that standpoint, and I put on a you know a mixed uh, black and uh, white or red. Is it black and red? Yeah, orange. Black and orange. Black and orange white. tail. Yeah. Wrapped that up, and then I looked again and figured, well, uh, maybe I should put the same combination of the, you know. Uh, the fly, or I mean, the fly stuff over the over the hook, mm-hmm. and they came up just with orange and black as the colors, both colors, mm-hmm. you know, and that seemed to work. It was a kind of a sloppy looking fly at the end, beginning, but later I learned how I perfected it a little better, so it looks smarter, I guess. So, why do you think it, it is such an effective pattern? For and is it mainly summer steelhead, or is it for winters too? No, I never fished that uh, winter. I never used that winter steel to steal that fishing too much. Um, I pretty much a summer, uh, a summer fly yeah. for me. Uh, I know there was a fella in Washington that uh, had claimed he had tied the fly. I remember that now. And so there was a fellow, a news news writer up in Washington, 
And I called him up and I said, you know, there's a guy down here that's, you know, uh, he's, tie, he's tying my fly and he's calling it his own. Yeah. Forget the, the, uh, the guy's name. But anyway, he wrote an article about it. And that pretty much set the straight oh, from yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. And of course, I had wrote an article about it too. Yeah. In in our in our area, so yeah. Yeah. that pretty much helped get past that yeah. problem. Yeah, cool. And and the fly that I like fishing, which is kind of a variation, is the Stewart, which is more of a black. Yeah. Black all right. Not any white with a little bit of orange. Bit of orange. And yeah. that was was that Marty Sherman who typed. Yeah, he did that. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Marty was a guy who worked for you, mm -hmm. and I think well, he worked for Clackcraft for quite a while. Yeah. 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 So I'm hoping to... There's another guy, too, that wrote uh, another fly that was Larry Pyatt. And he wrote, he, he tied the dark max. Oh, yeah. There's a family well, of the three. Pilot. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's the Hollywood max, too, right? Yeah, but who who did that? I didn't do it. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Somebody did that one. Yeah, uh, <laughs> there's the Hollywood. All right. And um, so minus the Deschutes, what's your favorite river? I don't know. Is if you take the Deschutes out of the mix, do you have a, a favorite, another river you'd say is your home river or something you really enjoy fishing? Yeah, yeah, there is. It's the um, um, river on the coast. And I'm trying oh. to. So tell me about the, so the North Fork of the Trask. Yeah, and uh, it's a short river and it runs all the way up to Bark Shanty Creek and then it goes up into the hills. And what happened was, after we had fished it for like seven, eight years, or maybe a little longer, is that a logging company went up there, and uh, at Bark Shanty Creek, they went in and cut the buffer zone up in the upper estuary. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, eventually over a period of time, it started, uh, uh, the bank started eroding, it started impacting the the, the land itself, and dumping, you know, uh, unwanted stuff in, into the river. And eventually, over time, uh, the fish, th that run of wild, there's a wild fish, not hatchery fish. Yeah. It, they just died off because of what they, what they did with the river. Mm -hmm. And that was, just, that was a real, a absolute shame. Because mm -hmm. it was easy to hook. I mean, you couldn't land them all of them because the river is small. Yeah. But I know my dad and I and Rob, my friend, there were times down there we we would hook hook eight or ten steelhead, yeah. no problem. Yeah. And was it uh, as far as the numbers? Were you were there any places you could go where you know you were happy just hooking into one steelhead where you didn't have to hook a bunch of steelhead? Or was you know was numbers always a big part of it? Well, I I, did. I never counted numbers, but you know. It's fun to catch fish. Yeah. And we never, I mean, my dad never kept a lot of fish. I mean, he figured catching a couple of fish, you know, is good enough. Mm -hmm. And we released fish, you know, if we, if we already had what we figured out was our limit. Yeah. But back there, there was, there was no, no limit. No limit yeah. back there, you know. Yeah. I think the most we ever had down there was with three of us. Maybe we had like, Five, six, six fish, maybe. Yeah. Between three of us. So. Okay. Yeah. What, um, you know, if you think out a little ways, maybe 30 or 40 years and your grandkids, maybe, you know, grandkids or grandkids' kids, what would you want them, uh, what would you tell them? Well, we're, what we tell them, what we got? Yeah, well, I'll say the grandkids' kids. <laughs> my, my kids are, oh, um, so yeah. I think about when they're, when they're 40, uh, what, what would you do? Well, your your family, you know, is they're hikers. You know, you love to hike. You love to be out. You love to camp. You love to be by the water, and you're teaching your girls how to enjoy that. Yeah. And eventually, maybe she'll learn how to catch fish too. Yeah. You know, yeah. so that's one thing. But yeah, you know, there's the others now. And John, he he's a, really a great athlete. You know, and basketball and baseball and cross country. But he really hasn't gotten in the flight because he hadn't had the time. You know, right. he's so active That's in right. sports in general. Yeah. But I think maybe when he gets through high school and yeah. so forth, maybe he'll start. Yeah. That's true. That's the first time I thought about that. Yeah, John hasn't uh, 
isn't uh, in the fly fishing, that is it? No, no. Yeah. Well, he, you know, we early on we took him out there a few yeah. times, and he learned how to cast a little bit, but he just he doesn't he doesn't get a lot of chances to go over there because yeah. he's so busy. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably because my kids are four and six right now, and this is kind of the year where I'm gonna. In fact, we're going over there this this weekend, hopefully, and I'm going to. This is like my year. I, regardless of if I catch a fish this year, they're going to fish. Right on. They're going to cast the fly yeah, yeah. as much as possible, and, and this is the year that I think they're yeah. going to they're going to get into right it. Right on. So, that's a good. That's yeah. that's great. What? Um, so now, if you take it even further out, because this video and the podcast episode, this episode will be out, you know, out online for fifty years or more. Mm -hmm. When we're when we're both gone. You know, what What uh, would you like to be remembered for in the fly fishing world? Wow. That's a tough question, you know. Well, uh, I suppose, uh, I suppose running a fly shop for those many years and being able to touch bases with so many people, teaching them how to learn how to do things, you know, tying flies, you know, fly casting and, uh, just learning from them as well as them learning from me. It just was an all around exciting experience. And then we, we ran our programs, you know, once a year, we always have that big uh, to do where we ha have everybody out and invited people to come in and take part of, uh, you know, the time of the year. But other than that, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm glad I lived through it. It was it was not easy. Sometimes, yeah. you know, I went through two recessions right. before we finally hung it up. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think the fact you being a, you were a school teacher for, in what grade was that, middle school? Yeah, before? it was seventh and eighth grade, yeah. Do you think that helped uh, in your, as a guide and being? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. And I even, I used to take kids out of class who were having trouble. I'd take them fishing. Yeah. I mean, I, and the girls, sometimes we'd get together and yeah. have things and yeah, that was great. I enjoyed yeah. the experience. Yeah. yeah. It seems like the teacher, I've heard that before that teachers are definitely, uh, you know, some of the best people in fly fishing because they just have that skill. Mm -hmm. What's, uh, if you, so other than the Max Canyon, um, you know, thinking of steelhead, what are your top, top two flies you'd, you would use? Besides the Max Canyon? Yeah. Um, and let's see for steelhead. Well, um, kind of the, um, I got to think cause I got a lot of top flies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got too many flies to be honest. Yeah. Uh, well, Chris is, you mentioned John, Chris is my brother. He, yeah, I asked him that and he said the green butt skunk. Yeah. Is that's the, that's one is for sure. The, the flyer is there a is there a like what did you use for uh, winter steelhead when you fish for winter steelhead? Uh, we tied flies up that uh, uh, had um, a yarn on, you know, like a so yarn a glow fly. bug. Yeah, glow bugs. Yeah, we did. We use those. Yeah, you know, I didn't didn't use a lot of you know uh, summer flies yeah. at all. You know, although some of the streams up on the coast, uh, you, you could do well with those. But here, like in the Sandy River, for example, uh, it was pretty much down and dirty and get to, yeah, get something rolling with whatever. So you're just trying to put it out, get it down to them, and yeah, for the race. Yeah, isn't a yarn fly is a good example. That, yeah. that's as good as any. Yeah, or gold bugs. Those are all good. What, uh, as far as a casting, you mentioned that you do a lot of single hand. What is there a, uh, a tip casting tip you would, you would give somebody if you're, you know, struggling? Well, don't break your wrist. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was yeah. a lot and of who people. Taught you, who taught you to cast? My dad. Yeah. And that's the first thing he said. He says, when you cast, you can't, you know, point your fist back and back of you. You've got to come up. And bring your arm back, and then stop. Feel the the pull on the line, and then come through, follow through, and release the line. It's mm -hmm. just so it's almost like a double haul. I'm, you know, if you want to use use it, that's basically what it is. Mm -hmm. But picking it up just like that, boom, boom, without you know 
most people they want to break the wrist. That's the biggest problem, I think. Okay. And so for we talked about your books a little bit. Was there you know another book you know throughout your fly fishing you know journey where something that helped you learn or a resource that helped you? Your I got a whole bunch of them right here, and I've read most of what them. What do you think is your? If you here is one of the best. Well, this is not steel, then. Yeah, or just trout or whatever. Well, Ray Bergman. Ray Bergman. Okay. Yeah. Really, and that what is that? That's a. Uh, That's his from, trout. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And this one by Joe Bates. Streamer, streamer fly tying and fishing. Yeah. Joseph D. Bates. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, these are two I hadn't really seen. Yeah. All right, I'll try to. I'm, it'll be interesting to see if these are out there somewhere, but I'll try to leave a link, <laughs> a link to those if they're yeah. still there. Yeah. So we've been talking a lot about uh, steelhead, Roy. It's it's interesting because we're going into a transition, and next week on the show, I have I documented our trip on the salmon fly trip, uh -huh. which I went, um, and it was kind of an interesting thing. So, we're, but we're just getting into trout. Yeah. So you guided for steelhead and trout. Mm -hmm. What do you think? You know, as far as trout. You know, is there a, a tip you would give somebody that's, you know, did you do a lot of dry fly fishing or wet fly or nymphs? Uh, you know, I I uh, did both, of course, but I was early on, uh, I used split shot a lot because that was so easy with a nymph to go down there and just roll cast it out, pick up the line and just dap it down. And you could just massacre fish almost a lot yeah. but over a period probably 10 or 12 years i'm just guessing i just it was just it's more it's it's more work than i really wanted to do because you're constantly you know moving and i just decided i'm just going to start dry fly fishing you know and maybe a little wet fly fishing but no no more just you know putting split shot on and sinking it down i just don't do that anymore yeah. i just didn't enjoy it as much yeah but with you know, if the dry line, you know, and the surface flies, you can see them come up and take it. That's that's the real exciting part yeah. of fishing with, with uh, dry flies. What flies are your favorite dry flies, or if you had to, typically do you fish most? Oh, uh, well, a dry fly, a goofus bug is a pretty good dry fly pattern. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there's a lot of them that uh, wet flies, probably. Um, my uh, Stewart's. Uh, let's see which one. Uh, oh, the dark tie down caddis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The yeah. dark tie down right. caddis. Yeah, I, right. uh, I did a video on that, so uh -huh. that, yeah. I'll, I'll link out to that video. Right. Yeah, uh, that was a good one. That's kind of fishing with the wet fly, mm -hmm. the wet fly swing. Yeah. Well, the thing is, you can fish that any way you want. Yeah. Beyond the surface, down. You know, you can pull it around or do whatever. And I just know that it's it's not infallible, but it's one of the better uh, all-around flies for trout fishing, for me, anyway. Okay. So we're getting pretty close to wrapping up. I had a, uh, a couple more questions. And one, I just want to go back to the, the mentors. So were, was there, you know, other than your dad throughout, you know, your time, somebody that was a mentor that, you know, helped with fly fishing? Or? Um. Anybody, anybody yeah, let's call? see. Uh, or do you just pretty much do it all on your own? Yeah, well, I, no, I learned a, a, a heck of a lot from. I think it was from the guys I started, like Steve Dorn, and some of some of his friends. Uh, that that's when I was teaching. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was teaching in. Night, night school mm -hmm. and I met a lot of people that way and some of the the, the wonderful friends I have today came out of those classes because mm -hmm. then I, we would go out together and, and fish together and uh, I think that was a special time yeah. for me too. So Steve Dorn was somebody who was just a friend and so, yeah. that was, so yeah. he was into fly fishing. Yeah, Jim Teeny was, you yeah. know, oh, we, right. yeah, we all piled around together yeah. for many years. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. Jim, Steve, was there anybody else? Yeah. That was the main. Oh gosh, I had so many of them, so many neat guys I yeah. met over the years. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so the website, uh, 
fly fishing with Doug Stewart, you haven't written there for a little while, but you did write quite a few blog posts with information. What oh, yeah. Think, if somebody was to go there, even though you haven't written in a while, you've got a lot of posts, what do you think? How would you explain the information that's there for people? Well, a lot of it's on you know how to do and so forth and all, but um, it also has a lot of unique stories, and most of them are true, <laughs> that I that I like to write, you know, experiences I had. Yeah. And it took leverage on that to embellish some of them for my own personal satisfaction. Yeah. Oh, so they're not all true at that yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And add a little, a little underhanded uh, yeah. you know, information. Yeah. <laughs> did you write on uh, Alaska at all? Um, you did a few trips up to, uh, was it mostly up to like Kodiak? <laughs> Or where, where, where were your trips up to Alaska? Uh, it was up to, that was, uh, let's see, we went up to the... You know, I guess you did rainbows and... Oh, we went up with a, with a team of, yeah. uh, that was, I forget their names. Yeah, it was teenies, uh, Yeah, that group there. I went up them for three years. Yeah. And that was, you know, we were just long for the ride yeah. and to help, you know, yeah. them run the show. Oh, I see. But we made a few of our own trips there. Going up to fish uh, a couple of the rivers up there around Kodiak. Oh, and what? For and what? what huh? For what species? Uh, for well, if you went to the Carlock River, yeah, you could catch salmon, steelhead. Oh yeah, uh, it's as far enough south. Huh? Yeah, silvers. Yeah, uh, and two or three other yeah. types of fish. Pretty much right. And it's grayling. In, huh? Catching grayling up there. Yeah. You catch yeah. six, seven, or eight different, you know. Was types there of, any ever any grizzly bear stories? Yeah, uh, in with the grizzly bear. Yes, unfortunately, we were lucky a few yeah. times. I mean, I had we had three encounters. Yeah, one was Larry Pyatt and I were down the river, and one up on the bank. These banks on the Carlock, they go up like this, and then you can't see what's on the other side, but there's really a lot of brush there. And we heard uh, one of those guys start growling at us, and we hightailed it real quick to get out of there. I did, we never did see him, but he was following us. And we got back to the cabin. And then the other time, uh, and this is, turned out to be a funny story, but it was pretty serious. We got into the cabin. And I was, went out there and I, to build a little fire so we could barbecue some stuff. Got it all set and everything. And, and I went back in and I came back out about 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later. And I checked him out. And all of a sudden I heard something sloshing across the river. And I didn't have to think twice because I headed back up. We got our guns and waited for about an hour. Because it definitely was a bear coming across to get that food. Mm -hmm. So anyway, finally when we uh, we gave it enough time, all of us walked out of there with our guns ready and flashlights and went down there. And the bear was gone. And so were all our, our fish. Oh, really? Yeah, he ate yeah. everything. Yeah, nice. <laughs> nice. We didn't have any dinner that night. Oh, that's probably good. The way <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's good. I've, yeah. I've had a few uh, run-ins with with bears, but uh, nothing nothing too extreme. Yeah. Uh, so I was, was going to note that all the we talked about a bunch of links, and this will be all at uh, wetflyswing dot com slash thirty one. So all the the show notes with all the I'll, I'll connect with uh, some of the stuff we talked about mm -hmm. here. So um, yeah, I, before I let you get out of here, I was just going to check on. You know, in the uh, well, I had one one last question, then then I'll let you get going. Um, so, is there a, you know, if you look back as far as kind of uh, you know, I guess we talked a little bit about this, but kind of a story that sticks out in your life that you know was kind of a turning point where it sent you into the fly fishing kind of niche, where maybe if you would have done something else, you would never got into you know as a business. Was there anything that rings? I would if I, if I hadn't had a business. No, but thinking back, like, if you think back in your life, is there, a, is there a moment in your life that kind of triggered you to go all in and into the fly fishing do you, as a business? Do you remember that? Yeah. 
And was there a story behind that? Well, I don't know if there's a story. Well, it, it all, it, it, it prompted me to give up my teaching uh, tenure. All right. Because after 15 years, things were happening with the administration and people within the Gresham area. You don't have to mention any names if you yeah. don't want. But uh, uh, it was just getting to be a real difficult job to try and teach people. And they were, they had inside some of the people were spies. They were trying oh, wow. to, and they were firing some, some, you know, yeah. some teachers because of that. And I just got to a point and, and I, I mean, I had to come home. I, mean, I don't know if you remember, but I was so like this. Yeah. I had Stressed to like out. take a Valium yeah. and, and maybe drink a couple of beers before I could settle my nerves down. Right. And wow. after, you know, a year and a half, or almost two years of that, I said, I'm done. Yep. I got to get out of here. I got to do something. And that's when I, yeah. I started so thinking. You, you've yeah. been building on the side yeah on the side the shop and right launched yeah i was tying flies building rods and i'm doing all that stuff yeah. on the side right that's cool yeah uh, that's that's uh well i guess a lot of stress i mean it makes sense just switching into fly fishing which is a little less stressful <laughs> yeah. was it was it quite a bit when you first when you what did it feel like when you when you pretty much quit your job and we're all in on what did that feel like just like a breath of fresh air yeah i mean I got out of that nest. It was just a nest of yeah. like stress. A, tra- stress. So, so I was, I, I lied. I got I one more question here. Um, so if you look back on your 25 year old self, you know, back when you were 25, yeah, what would you tell yourself that, you know, about kind of where your life and maybe things you might've done differently or just a, uh, maybe a word of advice. What would be a word of advice for that person? Oh, uh, well, um, God, that's a hard one to answer because, because when you're 25, you were in, were you at, uh, what, where were you when you're 25? You, I was still you, teaching. You oh, you just started teaching. Well, are you a few years? I got, I was still single then. Yeah. I got married but, when I was 26. Okay. So just before, there you go. <laughs> so this is just before you were you right. got married. Yeah. So would there be uh, any words of advice to, uh, to that 25 year old? <laughs> yeah. Pick the right lady, <laughs> 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 which I was lucky to do after 50, be 52 years, I think. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Good, good stuff. So, okay, well, that's about it. I just want to check on the uh, in the next six months or so. Mm-hmm. Is there anybody that anything that people can expect from you new coming out? You mentioned the book. Is there anything that we can keep an eye out for it? Oh, I don't know. Just um, staying healthy. Yeah, you know, and it ain't easy anymore. Once you start getting up in your senior, you know, your senior yeah. years, yeah, uh, you really gotta take it easier and slow, and you know. Yeah. Don't worry as much about stuff. Right. Yeah, because you know? you're, let's see, you're uh, coming up on uh, 80? You're 30, right? 30. Getting close. Yeah, getting close to 80. <laughs> so, it's, I mean, I just... Six yeah. months to be exact. Yeah, six months, right. <laughs> so, I heard uh, some stories, plenty of stories out there of guys that, you know, are 100 years old. Yeah. And they're out there still going yeah. strong and yeah. doing their stuff. So, I mean, it's yeah. not out of the ordinary for people to... Yeah. I think, I think that's the key is staying active and, you know, with your mind and... You know, well, that's one thing now too. I'm 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 riding my bike a lot now, and it's really really helped my legs. Yeah, my you know I've had such problem. I don't have that problem yeah. anymore. Yeah, and I every night I go up and, and ride. It. But yeah, yeah, that's, that's yeah. the key. Staying yeah. active. Mm-hmm. So if people want to find you, if they have questions, uh, where would you direct them? Use their phone. And you have a you have a number? Or do you want a website or any any? Oh no, we don't have a website. Just. Um, you're not really on social media or anything like that. No, so no. They, they could find you at the website though at uh, at fly fishing with Doug Stewart. Yeah, they and once in a while we get those. Yeah, that would be that would be way. Okay. But or they they could check with me too if you yeah. want to. But they could use our phone number too okay. right here. You know? All right. Yeah. All right. I'll leave a I'll leave a link to that yeah. then. Mm-hmm. So okay, well I think that that about does it. Just wanted to you know say thanks for spending the hour yeah. and uh, getting me into fly fishing. <laughs> that was. Uh, you know, I, I think about my mentors. I haven't, uh, I've done a couple of few interviews now on other podcasts, but you know, I mean, 
you're, you know, my biggest mentor. You know, I've had a lot of people over the years, but, you know, if it wasn't for you, I probably would have never got in this position. So, well, maybe, maybe not. But, you know, if you if you have people around you that are interested in this, this area, uh, you can make, you, you can really, it's hard to not make a better choice, you know, really. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing, even though there maybe isn't a, maybe it's not the biggest, uh, as far as making money, it's, it's definitely a, it's a good space to be in because a lot of good people and yeah, build up a great camaraderie yeah. you know, and all that. It's, yeah. it's all, it's, uh, it's what keeps the ball rolling, you know, as yeah. far as I'm concerned, being able to stay in touch with people. And I get people call me up periodically every now and then, Yeah, but a lot of them, you know, passed on. So, yeah. I got one, and then so we got the uh, the deer. Uh, well, we got the deer trip coming up. Are you are you in this year? On the, yeah, I told you that's going to be there. All right. And this time, I'm not going to break any. Crap that's right. Because like, last year, that was one of the things that I was a little bit after the trip because you took a fall and I think hit your ribs or something. Yeah, correct. And I was kind of thinking like, well, are you getting that point where it's a little bit too cold and nasty for you? Do you still want to come on no, the trip? That that's not the cold or nasty. It's it's being careful where you walk yeah and that's where i got my staff okay well um i'll let you get going and uh, i'll like i said let I'll, you get going i ain't going anywhere. yeah that's right that's right that's <laughs> right i want to get going i'll pick my stuff and uh and uh yeah we'll catch up with uh follow up with you when it would have all this out published and ready to go yeah we're going to to see how it turned out all right cool thanks so there you go if you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, go to wetflyswing.com slash 31. And if you get a quick second, even a one sentence, uh, one liner would be great. Uh, you can head over to that link uh, slash 31 and leave a short comment on the blog post. And uh, just let me know what, um, you know, some of your mentors, who they might be or, or what you thought about the episode. That would be really helpful to keep the conversation going. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to connect with you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.